Hello everyone, this video is in our Chess 960 series, also known as Fisher Random Chess. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and in this video we're going to be seeing a game between Komodo 10 and Berserk 9. This was played in the testing for the TCC Season 21 Fisher Random Chess event number 4. Um, chess engines really bring Chess 960 onto a completely different level and uh, I think we can learn a lot about playing Chess 960 by studying engine games and uh, this one is uh, quite a stunning one. Uh, it features an amazing knight sacrifice from Komodo 10 early in the game. Um, Komodo 10 doesn't manage to put it away, it was only playing on uh, four threads compared to Berserk's 104 um, and Berserk defends incredibly well but um, it's definitely um, uh, an early part of the game that's really worth seeing and really worth thinking about as well. So let's have a look at this one. So, you know, as always with uh, Chess 960, it's, it's valuable to uh, consider the disposition of the pieces um, before starting to, uh, to play through a game. And there are sort of four major anomalies to consider. Uh, first of all, the knights in both corners. Um, so when these knights develop, you know, either maybe, for example, to b3 or to c2, they'll actually be reaching squares that the knights could from the normal starting position could only reach in two moves. So it could conceivably, conceivably lead to um, uh, an acceleration of white's play. The second anomaly is the, the bishop on e1. And um, well, you know, bishops are funny pieces. Often, you know, even on their original starting squares, you know, on c1 or on f1, um, they can prove to be active and involved in, in, uh, in the game. On e1, that's less likely. Um, the bishop really just gets in the way of uh, kingside castling and um, isn't really pointing at any useful diagonals. So the most likely uh, thing is that um, this bishop will need a couple of moves to get active. Um, the queen on g1 um, is, uh, well, somewhat oddly placed. It's uh, in the way of kingside casting, of course, so might well have to move. The only uh, interesting thing about it is that the queen and rook are together. So that sort of gives you an idea for some space gaining with g4 and f4 very quickly. And that could make good use of, um, um, of the unusual position of the queen and rook. Uh, the other thing to notice is that uh, queenside castling is available immediately. Um... Now, in general, with Chess 960, you know, I try and uh, develop my pieces with some general guidelines, you know, just to, just as a way to steer through the complexity of a, of a completely unknown starting position. So I try and occupy the centre um, or control the centre with my pawns. Um, and then, you know, in classical chess, normally you occupy the centre, bring out the knights and then the bishops. Um, I tend to swap that around in chess 960. So I tend to, um, to, break, to try and uh, activate the bishops the sort of long-range diagonal pieces, the bishops and the queens, before the knights. Um, the reason for that is, is that the knights are often in unusual places. They don't automatically um, support the centre as, um, um, as the knights uh, in the classical starting position uh, do. And you're going to get some unusual pawn structures. So often it's better to, to, uh, to wait before deploying these uh, short-range pieces before actually um uh yeah you know before actually developing just to what to, to to try and gauge the type of pawn structure that's going to come up on the board uh, the other thing is not to castle immediately or very quickly even if you can but to um well to wait and see whether you can uh, exploit in some way you know the unusual position of uh, of your rooks it might well be that you can activate them quickly you know rather than just uh, castle quickly and try and get back to a standard position and, uh, well, in this game, Komodo does a fantastic job from the opening, I have to say. So f4 was played by, uh, by Komodo. So it's opening up uh, the line of the queen and opening up the line of the, uh, of the bishop as well. And also taking control of uh, some central space. Black replied with uh, f5, doing the same. And white plays uh, c4, uh, to which black replied with c6. So c4 is also um, activating uh, the light squared bishop and you'll also notice that both these moves c4 and f4 actually also restrict black's diagonal pieces so the bishop on b8 is restricted by the pawn on f4 and the queen on g8 is restricted by the pawn on c4. Um, black didn't actually dare to play c5 uh, didn't really want to uh, to give white um, uh, a target and just um, you know 
sort of um, uh, activated the bishop but in a slightly more cautious way so knight g3 was played um, and one of the funny things about uh, you know chess uh, 960 is that you uh, you gradually see connections being made between pieces and uh, and often they're rather unusual ones so here you know the the knight on g3 is connecting with a bishop on b1 against the pawn on f5 we could also imagine the the bishop coming to f2 combining with the uh, the queen and the uh, uh, and the bishop along the diagonal to attack the a7 pawn that's only defended by a bishop on b8 um, and here there's some uh, some possibilities. After knight g3, we've got um, uh, plenty of ideas here. Um, black could just play knight g6, counter-attacking against the pawn on f4. We could just play g6 to um, uh, defend the pawn on f5. Um, or we've got the move that was played in the game, quite uh, risky, knight to b6, hitting the pawn on c4. So sort of a tit-for-tat counter-attack. And um, yeah, I mean, if this was the normal starting position, this is where, you know, opening theory would um, would develop, really. Um, just uh, got me thinking somehow, you know, because, um, uh, well, I was looking at the move G6 and um, I was sort of thinking, you know, how human theory would develop. And uh, I'm sure one of the moves that would get played very, very quickly is this move E4. You know, looking um, at, at ideas like, uh, you know, f takes e4, knight takes e4, and, uh, you know, offering this pawn on f4. That's not quite an offer because the uh, the pawn on a7 is uh, is hanging if uh, if you take on f4. But, you know, that sort of thing, um, that's how human theory would develop. And then, uh, yeah, maybe somebody would, uh, would come up with, uh, you know, another slow move, maybe e6 to defend stuff, you know, and uh, human... Uh, human uh, theory would develop in that way it's just when you put it on the engine you know stockfish uh, is straight away saying boom g5 that's the move we played g6 and now we played g5 and um yeah i mean actually this uh, this turns out quite nicely for for black it seems to uh, to neutralize white's uh, position quite effectively g takes f4 the knight's coming round to g6 and we'll play e6 to chase away the knight with a pretty good position for black just goes to show, I think, that, um, yeah, opening theory in uh, Chess 960 will develop, um, yeah, much, much more quickly than humans can, uh, can, can, uh, can cope with, I think, once the, uh, the engines get to, uh, to grips with it. And, of course, this uh, TCC tournament is going to be, um, I think, you know, a huge test of, uh, of, uh, of Chess 960 opening positions. So, you know, it could be really very important theoretically. Well, Berserk played Knight B6, um, and after Knight takes F5... Knight takes c4 is possible. Looks very, very risky uh, to leave the knight dangling here on uh, on d4. And uh, queen d4 does hit g7 um, and the knight on c4. But after um, b5, b3, knight b6, well, if you grab g7, then the f4 pawn will be, uh, will be hanging. And, um, well, neither Leela nor Stockfish nor Berserk um, really found um, a good convincing way to uh, to get an advantage here for uh, for white feels odd you know feels very very nice for white this position but uh, yeah no they didn't uh, they didn't really manage to get more than a, a slight advantage for uh, for white but um, what berserk did in this game was the very risky g6 um, and the idea is um, um, is very normal. I mean, uh, you're just going to chase away this knight from f5, and once it moves back, for example, to uh, to g3, then I'm just going to take the uh, the pawn on f4. And actually, all that will have happened from the opening is that the f pawns got exchanged. You know, which is uh, perfectly fine for black. But um, well, Komodo played a move that really made me jump out of my chair. I was uh, watching this live. Um, knight takes e7 in this position. Um, I was trying to think, you know, of, uh, what does this remind me of, you know, from the st standard starting position? Maybe the Cochrane Gambit against the Petrov, that's e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, d6, knight takes f7. Um, there's also um, a, um, a, a knight takes f7 sacrifice against uh, a system that Bent Larsen played in the Alakin. Um, that um, that's maybe a little bit closer. I mean, in actual fact, these knight takes f7 comparisons are not too fanciful because, um, well, if you think about it, with a king on e8 and bishop on f8, the pawn on f7, the pawn in front of the bishop and diagonally uh, in front of the king, that's the weakest one. Uh, you move the uh, the king and bishop one square across, it's king d8, bishop e8 with a pawn on e7. 
yeah, of course e7 is the weakest. Of course that's the square that we should be uh, exposing. So knight takes e7 is quite um, is quite uh, logical, you know, from that point of view. I mean, the the point that it's really exploiting here. Um, well, the points are twofold. First of all, this whole um, set up the pieces here has very little control over the dark squares, the kingside dark squares, and that's mainly due to the fact that the knight is still on h8. On f7, it would exert some control, but um, here on h8, the the black pieces have very little control there. Um, and of course, you know. White's early moves activating the di long-range diagonal pieces have, um, have actually given White the opportunity to launch rapid attacks. And, um, well, Komodo really makes use of that one. So uh, king takes e7, bishop h4 check, and now king f7, the only spot for the, uh, for the king. If you go to d6, I've got c5 check. So king f7, and you can see how all of black's pieces here are hindered by the uh, the black king. The queen's blocked in, the bishop's blocked in, the knight's blocked in. So how should white continue here? Now, Komodo played the very tempting uh, f5, um, but after g5, white was forced to retreat the bishop, and uh, that gave black a, an extra tempo to, to organize itself. And uh, still, you know, very, very interesting play for white, but... Um, just feels a little bit slow. Um, when I um, ran these uh, these games on my uh, 94 thread machine and also on my 14 thread machine, actually, um, well, both uh, Berserk and Stockfish with White were playing this incredible move: c5, knight d5, e4, knight c7, and now spot the idea. It's beautiful. Um, it's the move a3. Uh, a4 was played by. Uh, um, by Berserk but uh, yeah this is just just as good of course and the idea is this bishop is coming out to a2 check which is going to be an astonishingly awkward um, uh, position for uh, for black you know bear in mind that a move like king g7 um, is met by queen d4 check so it's awkward all round for um, for black well um, amazingly the engines managed to keep things sort of afloat bishop a2 knight e6 and uh, here, um, you'd think that um, f5 is the obvious move. And it is quite dangerous. Only black's got this uh, great defense, queen g4 check. Rook f3, queen h4. Uh, rook c4, queen h2. Yep, the bishop on b8 is coming in useful there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's astonishing that, um, that you survive, but you do. Queen d4 takes knight check, rook e8. And, uh, well, black's uh, um, a pawn down, but opposite colored bishops rather passive knight on a1 some threats against the uh, the white king this uh, ended um uh, in a draw in uh, in most of my games so um so white plays we <laughs> there we are great animation castles queen side now why isn't black just completely lost in this position you know it feels like uh, that should really be the case uh, but the point is of course you know with fisher random um you know very often black's pieces are are really developed you know black's actually gained something like four or five development tempi and that is kind of the case here so um uh you know the rook is already on f8 which makes this artificial castling you know much much faster um once this bishop moves from uh, e8 the rook on c8 will be connected with the rook so you know black's activity black's development is also a lot faster um, I mean, White's exploited that with, um, you know, this uh, bishop coming to h4 and the possibility of the queen coming to d4. Um, and there are also possibilities of uh, of the rook coming to the third rank. So White's exploiting that for its attacking benefit, but uh, there is also defensive benefit for uh, for black as well. So castles, g5, uh, and a great defensive move, which uh, obviously had not occurred to me at all. What's the idea? The idea is bishop g5, king g8, and now... Uh, f5 leaves the bishop on g5 loose so black just gains a tempo in order to uh to, to defend itself against the threats along the a2 g8 diagonal and by good fortune he can do that perfectly with bishop f7 so knight takes g5 is a rather annoying threat there so bishop takes c6 and now um yeah d takes c6 was the move that was played most often by my engines although bishop takes c6 is uh, also possible um knight c2 rook c e8 and then uh, queen h3. Um, black was threatening now after rook c8 to play h6, uh, bishop h4, and then knight g6. 
emerging, attacking the pawn in f4 and the bishop. For example, um, you know, a very sensible move looks like d4, but we just go h6, bishop h4, throwing bishop h5, and then knight g6, and uh, we can see that black's counterattacking against the f4 pawn. Um, and after bishop g3, we go b6 and start chipping away at the white center. So these positions were being won by black in actual fact. So, uh, yeah, you can see how uh, how delicate the balance is. But, you know, after queen h3, white stands pretty well, really. Uh, you know, three pawns for the uh, uh, for the piece. We've got this threat of bishop h6. And, well, we've got a kingside uh, uh, pawn majority that's ready to roll. You know, these games were either ending as wins for white or um, or draws. But uh, all of them very difficult for um, for black. So um, I think that would have been the absolute best move in this position. Just c5, uh, just, uh, well, you know, gaining the center and uh, developing with, uh, with tempo. Pretty good, uh, pretty good idea, really, all the time. Um, f5 was played. Um, g5, bishop f2. And now uh, a clever move, queen g7. Uh, the king's ready to move um, uh, out to the... Uh, uh, Back to to g8, and then afterwards we can start covering the king with uh, minor pieces. Um, f6 was what was played by Komodo, but we get uh, a square for the queen. It's not comfortable yet, but um, it's possible. Um, incidentally, maybe bishop d4 was a little bit better than um, than f6. That was what uh, Stockfish was uh, and Berserk were were both playing, and uh, a lot of games ending in a draw. I think White still had a, a good initiative there, but. Um, uh, yeah, f6 is probably um, uh, a mistake here. Um, what's the reason for that? Well, um, Komodo had um, uh, a very nice idea here. Um, it uh, first of all played bishop c5 just to make sure this pawn is protected. And then it wants to play the move rook c3 to h3, hitting the queen on h6. A really nice idea. But Berserk finds, uh, yeah, really a very engine-like way to stop this. So bishop b5, stopping rook c3, d4 played. Bishop f4 now, and we're really aiming for this soft spot that we've created on, on e3. So rook c3 played, um, threatening rook h3, and now the move g4. So uh, stopping the um, uh, the rook from coming to h3. And after queen f2, black plays some, the great move bishop d2. Uh, the idea being that rook g3, trying to keep the rook on the third rank, allows knight take c4. I mean, uh, as, as a human player, I... Uh, I find it very confusing to, to keep track about where all these pieces are, are jumping in from. But obviously, if the engine's no uh, particular problem, and knight e3 check is going to come in. Um, I mean, it's still sort of balanced, but um, uh, you know, black's doing absolutely fine in this position. So after bishop d2, rook c2, bishop g5. Um, well, you know, the immediate danger has been averted. White won't get uh, its major pieces involved in the attack very quickly. What remains is um, uh, regaining the material with bishop f8 and then playing on the big pawn center. Now, I really did think that this would still be uh, quite substantially to White's advantage, but, um, uh, well, the king on d1 is rather awkward. Um, and, of course, these pieces are quite a long way from being developed. And uh, somehow that and, and Black's two bishops, which uh, are going to get active very soon, together with the queen, um, that gives Black excellent counterplay. So e4, king g8, takes, takes. Notice very nice that the bishop and the knight here are covering this uh, f7 square. Queen g3 was played. Um, bishop f7 hitting the pawn on, uh, on c4. So knight c4 to e3 is a big threat. b3, knight g6. And, uh, well, you can see that the black pieces are, uh, are coming in. And uh, there are plenty of open... There's, there's plenty of open space somehow in the, in the white position. You know, uh, losing those two minor pieces and, um, and having a big centre um, is sort of starting to work a little bit against white. So rook e2 was played, rook e8. Knight c2, activating the knight. Knight f4. Rook e1, knight h5. And um, uh, queen g4, knight f6. Queen f3, queen takes h2, and it's all about tactics, of course. Bishop h5 is a very big threat here, uh, hitting the queen. And, well, you really notice that the king is terribly uh, um, pinned to its place by the bishop on g5. It's a really useful piece, this one, uh, covering the uh, the king's escape and also defending the knight on f6. So rook e2 was played, queen h4, um, and it's starting to go wrong for um, for white from uh, from here on. So many threats here. 
uh, especially with Bishop H5 coming in. What um, uh, Komodo tended was um, it actually, you know, went for uh, this um, this ending. You're not going to believe the next move. Castles. There we are. That's what we needed. Castles kingside. So um, yeah, you know, the uh, the white king was not quite as uh, trapped as all that. Takes takes and knight c8. We got this very interesting. Um, two rooks against three pieces ending in principle the uh the three pieces should be better than the than the two rooks but it's a close run thing um i mean i had quite a few endings like this but normally with a couple of extra pawns for white which made the uh the fight quite even um here um somehow uh everything that uh, that komodo does just ends up creating more weaknesses and um uh, you just see how slowly and methodically um uh, Berserk is able to advance its pieces. Um, it's really as if you know the white pieces are, are powerless to um, uh, to make any impression whatsoever on the um, on on the uh, the black position. Black's uh, knight on d6 is superb um, in front of a white pawn, so unable to be chased away, covering all sorts of entry squares. And then we've just got the the two bishops to uh, you know work their magic, and we've got a few targets. We've got d5 and we've got g3 in particular. And uh, that's the one that um, uh, the black really wants. And uh, this bishop on g4 is an absolute rock, of course, defending h5 and d7. Uh, it is just too many minor pieces, really. So um, king g6, rook e8, king f5, bishop c5, king e5, and whoop, we pick up the d-pawn. That's the first one. And uh, uh, now the, uh, the king is going to... Uh, to start getting active i mean uh, i can just come in through b4 to a3 to attack the the pawns and there's very little that uh that, that white can really do about this look how solid that position is king b4 rook d8 knight f6 we're coming around to e4 now to attack the pawn on g3 and the rook on d2 rook c2 king a3 knight e4 and uh again very hard for uh, for white to uh defend everything you know the pawn on g3 and also its queen side so, uh, you know, moves like bishop b5 to d3, for example, could easily chase the rook away from uh, the second rank. So uh, the game continued a little bit more, but, uh, well, I think you can gradually see black just uh, um, eating away at the, um, at the uh, white position. And the next uh, sequence for black was knight c3 takes a2. And, uh, well, the whole queen side went and, uh, and white lost. Um, a very instructive uh, chess 960 game, I think. Um, I mean, I love this whole idea of um, of opening up the um, uh, uh, as many diagonals as possible and letting the long range pieces, you know, find uh, their range basically, you know, right from the start, and only then coming in with the knights. Um, I think you know what was also very interesting was the the number of possibilities that you had. You could sharpen the struggle with a counterattack or just defend, you know, and uh, and all of those possibilities were. Were, were were decent in actual fact some better than others but uh um but what i also found you know very interesting was just the uh the possibility that just after five moves you could always already uh sacrifice a piece and expose the opponent's king and uh but all made possible by the fact that the uh the long range diagonal pieces have been brought out into uh um into the fray very very early um much more important really than uh you know than than, than to get both knights involved and uh, yeah, I think this uh, idea that um, that Stockfish and Berserk and uh, uh, found, you know, just the idea of going c5, e4, and a3, was quite beautiful. But of course, you know, just remember, don't always judge, uh, you know, a, a chess 960 position by um, by uh, you know standard chess standards. Uh, very often, you know, the strange pieces that your pieces are in, they, they they just mean simply that your pieces are already developed, and that definitely offers additional defensive chances. I mean, here the pieces are very awkward because they're not really covering dark squares at all on the king side, but the fact that the rook is there does allow the king to castle artificially very quickly which you know of course is uh, is very very useful uh, but of course none of this would have uh, would have worked at all for black if it wasn't for these uh, you know uh, amazing tactics with um, well with first of all with uh, uh, meeting f5 with uh, takes takes and queen g4 check very important and also that after castles you can play this amazing idea g5 just giving up a pawn just to draw the bishop onto an attack square and prevent f5. I mean, these are really complicated, difficult things to uh, to see.
you know certainly from uh, from uh, a position like uh, you know move six or seven then it's uh, really quite complicated but there we are i mean i hope that's uh, inspired you as it uh, as it inspires me um uh, do take a look at the uh, tcc T, um, frc tournament uh, definitely worth it some fantastic games uh, i'm sure uh, always every year and uh, well i don't think this is going to be any different especially with the number of uh, very strong frc engines that we've got um if you like this video why not give it a like or even subscribe to the channel or even take a look at the silicon road to chess improvement my new book wow something's happened in a tcc game i think you can tell um uh yeah the silicon road to chess improvement absolutely worth a bang um uh full of uh, engine chess and also a little bit of uh, chess 960 as well uh in the section on pawn sacrifices and uh otherwise you know thanks very much indeed for watching and uh hopefully see you at the next video